So, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth lecture. I'm trying to follow a somewhat logical, as logical as possible order in these lectures. And um, we saw uh, the formation of the Ganga of India civilization uh, in, in the north of India, which gradually spreads. But as it spreads, many things happen. And uh, one thing which happens is that this um, notion of India as one entity takes shape. So that is basically what I intend to explore today. And um, you know, there are endless discussions in the scholarly world and um, also among intellectuals as to what exactly is India. And uh, there are many different opinions. Uh, so I'm not even going to try to really define what is India, but rather to let certain mechanisms which uh, historically took place uh, maybe give us a clearer idea of what this civilization is about and how did it come to create this unity. So, well, the pictures you see here, some of you might recognize what it is about. I will come to that in the course of the lecture. And uh, first of all, we have to examine one line of thought about the idea of India, which, is, uh, which took shape during the colonial time. Because remember, the British came, and what they found was, of course, a decrepit Mughal empire. Uh, but there were, uh, you know, there were still some pockets of resistance here and there <coughs> fighting against the Mughals. And uh, they found basically an India which was politically disunited. So this is reflected, for instance, in this uh, thought of Karl Marx, who rise in 1853 at the height of the um, uh, colonial rule, when he says, <coughs> he says India could not escape the fate of being conquered by England. And the whole of her past history, if it be anything, is the history of the successive conquests she has undergone. Indian society has no history at all, at least no known history. What we call its history is but the history of the successive intruders who founded their empires on the passive basis of that unresisting and unchanging society. Now, this is a very important statement because uh, it makes a lot of assertions. First of all, that India has no history except the history of all the invasions. Basically, it's a first starting probably from the Aryan invasion, uh, according to our textbooks, and of course, up to the invasion by the British. So, he, there is beyond that, this, there is nothing much which we can grasp as uh, which could be called Indian history. Secondly, he says, this unresisting and unchanging society, these are typical colonial stereotypes where uh, Indians, Indians were, and, and especially Hindus, were portrayed as being passive, lethargic, sunk uh, in uh, slumber, etc., etc. Or if they were not sunk in slumber, they were meditative, contemplative, otherworldly, and in any case not interested uh, you know, in, in things uh, down in this world. So uh, it is true that the British did not encounter much resistance when they conquered the subcontinent. So they were entitled to believing this. Uh, nevertheless, the history of India, as it became clear later on, showed that uh, there is nothing uh, so passive and certainly nothing unchanging about Indian society. It went through a lot of upheavals long before the British came, and a lot of warfare, a lot of resistance uh, in many ways. So, so this is a stereotype, which I think is quite outdated today. But there is another stereotype, uh, which I've borrowed from a British historian, John Seeley, and uh, who says, and this stereotype is still alive, at least I have noted this uh, in my you know, exchanges with many people in India. And he says in 1883, he says India is not one country. And therefore, it has not 
one civilization. It has not even so much unity as it seems to have for Brahminism, which was actually a name that uh, Indologists were giving to, uh, you know, those, um, I mean, the, the, the uh, Vedic, Upanishadic, Vedantic traditions. Brahminism, by its peculiar trick of absorption and, si and assimilation, has brought together under one name forms of civilization which are really diverse. So actually we're going to, my whole talk is a kind of critique of this statement. And, uh, uh, but then this uh, statement has had a very long life. And I have met many Indians who are absolutely convinced uh, that it was basically the British who created India. And many people have told me so. And it is even suggested in some textbooks that basically there was no, you know, there was no Indian nation, no, no, nothing which can be defined as, as India before the British came. And it was them who, by conquering the whole subcontinent, made it one. So this we will examine. And we will also examine this statement that, uh, about what does he mean by Brahminism, by its peculiar trick of absorption and assimilation. I'm going to spend a little time on this. Uh, because there is a phenomenon of absorption and assimilation. Uh, is it a trick? Well, you will decide at the end. So this is the idea. And then if you look at a text from the Vishnu Purana, you have a different definition. The definition is the country that lies north of the ocean, that's the red line, and south of the snowy mountains, which have marked, of course, in red, is called Bharata. Now, that's a very clear and simple definition. Uh, this text is uh, dated that the latest during the Gupta age, which would be 4th, 5th century AD, but probably a little earlier, could be anything between 1500 and 2000 years ago. Anything. We, don't, we cannot date Puranas very precisely, but it is one of the older Puranas. So you can see that here there is an idea which so far we can only call geographic. Okay, there is a geographic entity defined geographically as being Bharata. So already we have something which doesn't seem to agree with what, which what we have seen before. Let us continue by jumping back in time. This is just a brief reminder of what we saw the other day about the geography of the Rig Veda, Sapta Sindhava. Sapta Sindhava is, is, well, the rivers you see here. And uh, Rig Veda does not apparently know much what is uh, east of Ganga uh, or the southern part, the Deccan Plateau, etc. This is his, its territory. And um, um, if it knows anything beyond this region, it doesn't mention it. So this is how we start the, the uh, because we, this is the most ancient text we have. And if we, well, I'm not dating the Rig Veda today, I'm not trying to do that. But if we look at the Indus civilization, whether it was before or after the Rig Veda, whatever, we see that it is more or less the same territory which is occupied. <coughs> so there is a, a concentration here, uh, both for Harappan and Vedic cultures in the Northwest. But later on, later on, we get to have different definitions uh, of either India or parts of India. So for instance, Manushmriti, which is probably 4th or 3rd century BC, says that land created by the gods, which lies between the two divine rivers, Saraswati and Drishadvati, the sages call Brahmavarta. So if you look at the map, this is on top the Saraswati as it has been identified with the Gagar. I showed you this. Uh, the other day, and uh, <coughs> which probably had stopped flowing beyond this point during the time of uh, Manushmriti, but uh, you know this is the satellite view, uh, which continues the mark of it continues today, and Drishadvati is this river. If I come back, you see there is a confluence here. Definitely, it is well marked. The mark is more indistinct here because the Tower Desert has encroached. But then we can see many streams coming from this uh, uh, area. And this river here, this stream rather, this uh, bed, because it is dry most of the time except during good monsoons, is called today 
in this section it is called the Chotang or Chitrang River today in Haryana. So, but it has been identified by generations of scholars with the Drishadvati, which is a river mentioned in the Rig Veda. So, what Manushmiti here tells us is that this region, of course, it is not its knowledge of India is not at all limited to it, is regarded as particularly holy. And the reason is actually very simple to understand. It's because the the if you read see objectively the evidence from the Rig Veda, many of the hymns of the Rig Veda were composed on the banks of the Sarasvati and Trishadvati. So therefore this would be you know, carried in the later tradition and this region would be made particularly holy. Now India, uh, uh, of course, uh, much more than this was known to Manushmriti, but uh, if we take other texts like uh, uh, there are uh, Dharma Shastras written by Bhavdayana, Vashista, Patanjali in his Mahabhashya, his commentary on the grammar of, Patan, of uh, Panini uh, uh, also speaks of, you know, describes uh, the, the, the India as they know it. And here this notion of Aryavarta, you know, the, that is to say, literally speaking, the noble land comes into, into view and it is described as the region east of Adarshana. Now, Adarshana, of course, means invisible. And it is the same, it is a synonym in the literature with Vinashana, which is the point where Sarasvati disappears in the desert. Somewhere here, you see, this is the mark still of the Sarasvati. Then west of a certain black forest, which has been identified with the forest uh, uh, which, is located near, which was located near Haridwar, south of the Himalayas, of course, and north of a part of the Vindhyas, which was called in those days, Pariyatra. Now, if you put a, a mark on the map, this is what it would come to. Of course, the straight lines would not be straight. They would not be so clearly defined at all. But this is broadly the region which uh, those uh, scholars talk about a few centuries BC. So it, we, it is clear that the, uh, that the Northwest continues to occupy a great cultural importance. Then there are other definitions. And the definition which starts to dominate in the text is that of Jambudvipa. Now what is Jambudvipa? Literally speaking, it means the island of Jambu or Jamul, that fruit which is here, which of course you are all familiar with. And, uh, but then this Jambudvipa is defined in strange ways. And here we see a fusion between, because Jambudvipa is clearly the whole of India, this whole peninsula the whole of India is Jambudvipa. It is actually commonly used uh, in the text as a synonym with India and uh, with Bharata, for example. But there is also a mythological definition in the Puranas, which then, you know, uh, many people are confused and try to actually make it match the geography of the world, but it, it will not work for the simple reason that you have Jambudvipa at the center and then you have seven encircling oceans, actually alternations of oceans and continents and oceans and continents. And uh, the, the uh, oceans are said to be salt water, sugarcane juice, wine, ghee, curd, milk and water finally. So uh, this is of course not something that we will e you know, easily be able to match with reality. And though there have been brave attempts to match those seven continents with the continents we know today, I, I don't consider that it is really worth the effort. It's, it's a mythological construction, nothing else. And ancient Indians, you know, love to, to do that, to bring different streams together, the, 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 the geographical, the cultural, the mythological. There was absolutely no difficulty in mingling all of it together. Uh, so the, the, there is, um, uh, this is something we need to understand in the ancient mind, and we'll come back to it. So when we come to the political reality of ancient India, I showed this map already of the Mahajanapadas. Now the focus has shifted from the northwest to the east. This is of course the Ganga civilization. And uh, we see now that uh, there is uh, quite an integration taking place because the whole uh, uh, northern belt is integrated, but also parts of the Deccan. And of course, we saw that 
under the Mauryan Empire, this uh, expands to almost the whole of India, in fact, also the whole of Afghanistan, uh, even parts, a small part of what is today Burma, and um, uh, except for uh, the extreme south. So here we have the maximum expanse of the uh, phenomenon, which we can call the political integration of India. And because Ashoka uh, spread his edicts everywhere, and they were, you know, in those days, this is well established by the literature, they were wandering monks, Jain monks, Buddhist monks, uh, who were spreading <coughs> their uh, teaching all over India, including, including in the far south. Uh, Tamil Nadu, for example, had a very strong uh, both Buddhist and Jain presence. Uh, Kerala had quite a bit of Buddhism. So, so uh, this, I will return to it in a few minutes, but uh, this was possible because there had been, first of all, a political integration. So then, of course, you can see that this uh, British claim, which was repeated quite often, that there was basically no such thing as India. You know, that uh, it was they who uh, united the subcontinent. Uh, well, in the 19th century, it may be a valid claim, but uh, certainly not if you look at the whole history uh, um, from ancient times onward. And uh, well, this, was, this conquest was done through warfare, and uh, the historical India is certainly a place full of warfare. Uh, we, we have um, lots of, actually, texts on the theory of warfare. Uh, if you read the Mahabharata also, you have you know, long discussions on the code of Kshatriyas and so on. So, uh, and, and many such uh, depictions uh, in temples, on frescoes, etc. <coughs> and uh, warfare actually becomes, uh, is a necessary part of this uh, geographical, political integration of India. So it is one of the mechanisms. But there are other mechanisms which uh, uh, I would like to spend a little time on. And one is that, you see, we see these big kingdoms and empires, and uh, uh, the Mauryan Empire will be followed by uh, the, the, the Kushan, and the, uh, then we will have the, uh, later on, the Gupta, we'll have the Shatavahanas, we will have so many different empires trying to recreate this kind of unity, political unity, without ever succeeding to this extent. But there is another phenomenon which is neglected, and which is quite important in the integration of India, which is the spread of democratic institutions. Now, the other day I mentioned that the Mahajanapadas functioned, uh, some of them functioned through assemblies in a fairly democratic manner because the kings were sometimes elected. They were not always hereditary. That institution did not uh, last, and the hereditary uh, uh, f you know, transmission monarchy prevail in the end, but the phenomenon of assemblies, representatives, people being used to having their say, to uh, uh, express their voice about the, the, the needs at uh, ground level, about the, you know, the kind of assistance they require from the rulers, this became widespread throughout India. And uh, we have this uh, Canadian historian, Steve Mulberger, in a recent um, uh, study about 10 or 15 years ago called um, Democracy in Ancient India. He writes, and I think this is an important statement because it doesn't come through very clearly in, in our history textbooks. He writes, the experience of ancient India with republicanism, if we, better known, would by itself make democracy seem less of a freakish development and help dispel the common idea that the very concept of democracy is specifically Western. It is especially remarkable that during the near millennium between 500 BC, that is to say the beginning of all these institutions in the Ganges Plains, and 400 AD, and that is more or less the start of the Gupta Empire, we find republics almost anywhere in India that our sources allow us to examine society in any detail. So this was, in fact, a, an important phenomenon, uh, the spread of democratic ideas and practices. The republics of India were very likely more extensive and populous 
than the police of the Greeks. The police means the, the, the city-states of the Greeks, uh, which were democratic institutions. And the, the, the usual claim in Western history textbooks is that basically the Greeks invented democracy. The existence of Indian republicanism is a discovery of the 20th century. The implications of this phenomenon have yet to be fully digested. Historians may find in the Indian past, as elsewhere, plenty of raw material for a new history of the development of human government. So this is you know, one field where some of our historians should actually uh, spend time and uh, research uh, because, because, well, uh, India then will be shown, even though there were kingdoms everywhere, uh, the important thing here is that the monarch was not an absolute monarch as he was, for example, in medieval Europe, where the, the, the king had you know, absolute rights over the, the subjects and the population. This was not the case in India because of this existence of democratic institutions. I'm giving one example <coughs> because it's important to understand uh, this phenomenon of you know, integration of India. And it's the case of Uttaramerur, which is a, a, a small town uh, about 100 kilometers from Chennai, uh, which uh, was an important center during the Chola uh, kingdom uh, in the 10th century CE, the historical Cholas, uh, where there were all kinds of assemblies. There were village assemblies, there were assemblies at the level of the town or city, and then of course there was the assembly uh, around the king himself. And each assembly was governed by sets of rules, precise rules and guidelines, uh, which uh, apparently, from what we know from the records, were strictly enforced. And this is what made the Chola administration uh, quite remarkable, very systematic, very thorough, but to some extent democratic, thanks to the existence of these assemblies. So, for example, the village assemblies, uh, you know, were very important because they were at the, at the bottom of the whole pyramid. And they were both qualifications as well as disqualifications uh, given for the candidates who wanted to be elected. The word elected is not exactly correct because what happened is that ultimately the, screen, the, the candidates who had been screened and accepted, their names was written on a piece of something, maybe a piece of palm leaf or bark or something, and it was all put in an urn. And then, it, and this is explained in these long inscriptions in Uttarameru, then a child of the village would be called, and the child would pick out of the urn the required number of people to fill up the assembly. So it was not strictly speaking an, an election, but uh, the, there was a screening of candidates, and then they were chosen randomly. So qualifications, they had to know by teaching, that is to say, they had to have been taught. You know, it was not just that they had to have read some Vedic texts. And usually by this, many things could be meant, including even the uh, Dharma Shastras. They had to have a tax-paying land and house. Now, this is interesting because it means that they had to have a certain minimum wealth. Uh, they were not to be, uh, uh, so that they would not be tempted, you know, that is the idea. Age between 35 and 70, well, there's been a bit of discussion recently in the country about, uh, you know, what should be the, the, the limit uh, for the age of our politicians. So maybe, I don't know, if we could draw in, in inspirations from such inscriptions. One who possesses honest earnings, whose mind is pure, and who has not been on any of the committees for the last three years. Very important because villages had lots of different co uh, committees. They were very well organized units. For example, for water structures, there would be a committee, and the villagers would receive funds to maintain the water structures for the, for the benefit of the entire village. So uh, the, these kind of committees were powerful, they were funded, and therefore they didn't want somebody who had just been on, on one of these committees to be a, a member of the village assembly, because then vested interests would develop and lobbying and you know all the evils we are quite familiar with so this is one method they followed disqualifications one who has been on any of the committees that is to say three years uh, before but has not submitted his accounts you see if you have spent money 
and you have not submitted accounts, you can't be a candidate. So you see how strict uh, the, the one who has stolen the property of another, well, of course. And finally, relatives of a candidate cannot be candidates. So you kindly compare with you know, what we have in India today. Uh, I don't know how many of our MPs and MLAs would uh, meet those conditions, but uh, uh, you certainly cannot say that democracy was born in 1947. The, the democratic traditions are far more ancient, and they uh, uh, had a very important role in the integration of the country. Now, demographics. See, we are talking about India. Now, who are the Indians? How do you define them? Today, we have so many definitions, but in ancient times. So, of course, today, first of all, uh, I, I'd like to just give brief statistics from the People of India project of the Anthropological Survey of India, which was conducted, and I believe 20 monumental volumes were published documenting all these uh, 4,694 uh, 4, uh, communities, segments, uh, territorial units. That is to say, what is, you know, what is called jatis, all the communities of India. So this was an enormous uh, effort. And uh, the survey detected 325 languages, five language families, 25 scripts, still being used in India, and this was sometime in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, K. Singh, uh, re, uh, who uh, passed away a few years ago and who was uh, the, the Director General of the Anthropological Survey of India, wrote quite a few important books and uh, you know he, he has his own way of putting it across. He says, Indians are reported to have relatively larger eyes. This may be because our eyes are popping all the time there is so much beauty, so much diversity to behold. So certainly this diversity is mind-boggling, but actually it was known in ancient times. And this is one example I could give many, but I'll just take the most representative example, which is the ethnographic picture which you get from the Mahabharata. And here you see uh, a map which I borrowed from a very fine book recently published by K.S. Valdia, who is actually a geologist, interestingly. And uh, here he has put, but there were such maps uh, published uh, earlier too, uh, he has put all the main janas or jatis listed in the Mahabharata. So you can, of course, recognize yourself. Quite a few of these names are familiar. Some are still used, still in use today. Uh, uh, you can see the south was uh, well known too. And uh, you can see here very clearly that, as I mentioned, I think, briefly the, the uh, last time, Mahabharata knows the whole of India. And, and it, it knows in detail. And then it gives details about these, these peoples, the various peoples of India. And you can see that it extends from uh, Gandhar, what is today the Swat Valley of uh, Pakistan, even actually a little beyond into Afghanistan, in the east, and I'll come back to this point, it speaks of Pragyotisha, Kamarupa, which are various denominations for the northeast, south I have mentioned. So the whole of India is covered. How, um, <coughs> so numerous languages are mentioned, the different cultures, the different rulers, and actually all of these rulers, of course it is a, 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 a symbolic device, if you like, all of these rulers are supposed to be present during the war and to you know, be on either side of the, of, of the Great War. Uh, so how are these 363 peoples uh, listed? They are listed as Jana or Jatis. A Jana is, is a people especially forming a state. A Jati is a community which, but then the definitions are a little fluid. Don't take it as uh, very strict. But it's basically a segment of a, of a jhana. For example, the Kiratas, uh, are, have, they, they are one jhana, but they have several jatis, uh, according to Mahabharata. But the very important thing, and this is something which, unfortunately, we have completely lost sight of. We've been uh, you know, brainwashed by the British uh, colonial anthropology, which completely cut the tribal communities apart from the mainstream basically for purposes of conversion. And, but this is something which was not the case in the ancient literature. And in the Mahabharata, there is no distinction between caste and tribe in the sense that 
uh, there are janas w w uh, or jatis which are part of the mainstream, you know, recognizable as castes uh, today, but the, 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 the tribes also are, are janas or jatis. They are just the same. It's just that their physical environment is different. So K. Singh writes, there is hardly any evidence to show in the, that in the collective consciousness of India there is any difference between the two sets of janas. And the definitions are like this. Sometimes they are defined in geographical terms. So you will be told that this jhana is in this region. You know, this is uh, how it works. And the total totality of the region is again Jambudvipa in Mahabharata. Or in political terms, that is to say in terms of uh, uh, political units which are called Janapadas or Varshas or Rashtras. Again, these terms are slightly fluid and, and sometimes interchangeable, but this is the term, these are the terms which are used, but very much in ecological terms. So there is a division where, because this listing occurs at several places in Mahabharata, not just one place. And in, in one place, the, all the Janas are separated in, uh, in ecological uh, divisions. Uh, so those who live in the mountains, I won't I'll skip the, the, those names, those who live near rivers, those who are from desert, deserts, and those who live in pastoral lands. So the, the um, physical environment is also one way to define the Indian people. Now, um, I'll return to Mahabharata a little later, but then uh, we have to see this concept now at this stage of uh, sacred geography. What, is, what do I mean by sacred geography, which now actually is a recognized discipline in Western academia. Uh, you, can, you can have uh, uh, an MA and a PhD in many universities in, in this field of sacred geography. That is to say, geography fused you know, with the, the culture, the mythology, uh, all these uh, other disciplines. So I think as a, the, the best possible example, this story of which some of you I'm sure have recognized of Shiva and Sati and you know the story that uh, Sati and you can see her here uh, felt insulted when uh, her father uh, failed to invite uh, Shiva at a sacrifice and she immolated herself she invoked the fire and she immolated herself. That's why the, the color is uh, deep orange here. And then Shiva came on the scene and of course destroyed just about everything. But then he uh, took the body of Sati and put it, according to some stories, not exactly like this old painting, uh, put the body on his shoulder and then he started roaming the world in a great fury. And you know, Shiva's fury is always something that uh, in the mythology threatens to destroy the, 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 the whole universe. And to him, one universe more or less doesn't really you know, make much difference. So he goes about like this and then uh, uh, humans of course are alarmed and they run to Vishnu whose job it is to protect actually and preserve the universe. And they say, please do something. So Vishnu runs after Shiva and starts chopping off the body of Sati, you know, so that by and by, the, the, you know, Shiva will end up having nothing left with him. And so one hand falls here, a part of the head falls there, uh, uh, the foot falls elsewhere, and these are all the sites, the Shakti Mahapitas, 51 sites which you can visit today and which are associated, all of them, with one particular, and you have different lists. Uh, the main, probably the oldest list given in the, is in the Shiva Purana. But there are, it is repeated as always with you know, minor variations in various texts. Uh, it becomes something of a tantric uh, tradition also, which is why, of course, Shakti uh, is, of, I mean, is part of the tantric tradition, but that is why you have a concentration in eastern India, in, in Bengal uh, especially. But basically, all parts of the country, including uh, Nepal, including Sh the north of Sri Lanka, are covered. And so this is actually, to me, it's a very beautiful metaphor because it is a way of saying that uh, this land is actually the, 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 the body of the mother, of, of uh, Sati, of Shakti. And uh, therefore, you, you 
create an association between the land and the, the divine element. And, um, uh, and, and these traditions are still very strong. You can go and visit any of these sites, and some people try to visit as many as possible during the lifetime, of course. Uh, but then there are, uh, uh, the, yeah, I wanted to, to mention also, I, for, I was forgetting, that this is probably an extension <coughs> of the original sacrifice mentioned in the Rig Veda. In the Rig, uh, not exactly in the Rig Veda, but in one of the Brahmanas, commenting on the Rig Veda, one of the Brahmanas explains this universe as the sacrifice of Prajapati. Prajapati is the creator who be, later on becomes Brahma, and the gods and the rishis kill him and split his body into different parts which become actually the whole universe. So this is a story told in one of the Brahmanas, and uh, I, I suspect that this uh, uh, legend here is actually you know, uh, on the model of the old uh, story of Prajapati. Then the institution, the very important institution of pilgrimage, which of course uh, follows logically from such uh, traditions, which played a very important role in ancient India in uniting people, in making people from various parts of India meet each other. And it is not just, we always think that pilgrimages are for religious purposes, it is not true. Many other things happen during pilgrimages, in particular, uh, the exchange of knowledge and the exchange of manuscripts. And for example, we, we know that uh, manuscripts of uh, ancient mathematics or astronomy uh, you know, were actually exchanged during such pilgrimages. And this is how scholars, uh, you know, it became a, a, a one mechanism for the, uh, knowledge transmission. So in time you have a dense network of uh, holy sites, tirthas, uh, across the whole of India. Uh, for example, but there are many networks. I mean, I could spend uh, an hour just on this question alone. I'm just giving a few brief examples. You have the Chardham of India and uh, see how they are located deliberately by whom we will never know. But somebody deliberately chose the fact that these four holiest sites which normally you know uh, in orthodox Hinduism any Hindu at least should visit in his lifetime these four. The rest is minor are located at the so Badrinath, uh, Dwaraka, Puri and Rameshwaram. So I think it cannot be a coincidence that they, they are in the, these, they cover the four uh, cardinal directions of India. You have the 12 Jyotir Lingas, which you can see here on the map. And um, of course you have the Kumbha Melas. We are used to four sites, Allahabad, Aridwar, uh, Nashik and Ujjain, but actually originally there were 12 Kumbha Melas across India and uh, one of them uh, all the way south in Tamil Nadu, in Kumbakonam. So these uh, networks, you know, which are uh, kind of superimposed over each other in Tamil Nadu, we have 108 shrines to Muruga. Uh, there are also 108 uh, shrines to Vishnu. It's, it's kind of endless. And um, this, of course, contributes a lot to this uh, cultural concept of what India is. Um, which is why somebody, a great Indian, said India has for ages past been a country of pilgrimages. All over the country you find these ancient places from Badrinath, Kedarnath and Amarnath high up in the snow Himalayas down to Kanyakumari in the south. What has drawn our people from the south to the north and from the north to the south in these great pilgrimages, it is the feeling of one country and one culture. So this, uh, this statement, you know, today would be regarded as uh, almost uh, unsecular, making, you know, India out of uh, basically a, a, a religious network. But uh, I'm playing it very safe by choosing uh, Nehru, uh, so that... So that nobody can take objection, but this is how he views India after all. And uh, I'll return to him actually in a minute. Then of course we have the literature. And uh, literature, well this is an endless topic, but I'm choosing two very important great factors 
of national integration, if we want to use the modern phrase, <coughs> one of course is the Ramayana, which uh, connects, as you can see from one of the possible reconstructions of uh, uh, the, the journey of Rama uh, all the way to Lanka, um, you, you can see that the north and south are connected. And of course, there are other kingdoms which uh, do intervene in the story and uh, which, which integrate pretty, pretty much the whole of India, though perhaps not as clearly as in the Mahabharata. The, the listing is a little less precise. Uh, there are regions which seem to be left out, like the northeast, some parts of the west, but still we, we see a broad in, uh, integration. I'm to, going to spend more time on the Mahabharata, and I'm back to Nehru, because he wrote uh, uh, a long passage in his discovery of India on the Mahabharata where he explains that he travels across India and he meets you know people uh, everywhere he talks to them and then he found everywhere and he was surprised in fact he did not expect it that the old epics of India the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and other books in popular translations and paraphrases were widely known among the masses, and every incident and story and moral in them was engraved on the popular mind and gave a richness and content to it. Uh, you know, even our politicians constantly speak of uh, Lakshman Rekha and uh, so many other you know, phrases, as he says, taken from the epics. Illiterate villagers would know hundreds of verses by heart, and their conversation would be full of references to them or to some story with a moral enshrined in some old classic. So this is a fact. This is quite undeniable. Anthropologists who have studied you know, the impact of these uh, epics on the, uh, not only actually in India, but as we will see next week, beyond India, well beyond India, have been struck by you know, the way these two texts have been massively adopted, not only adopted, but also adapted and freely adapted, freely rendered, translated, modified in, in, in hundreds of ways. And um, <coughs> uh, uh, this is uh, one great factor of uh, uh, national... You, you, you remember that, um, well, perhaps not the young, youngest here, but I think some 10, 10, 15 years ago, when the Mahabharata series was screened on Doordarshan, uh, some of you would remember how the whole of India came to a standstill. Uh, there were few TVs at that time. It was about 15 years ago, I think. 88, was it? Okay, so, so 25 years ago. All right. Well, I, I somehow remember I did not uh, date it. And, <clears throat> you know, there were very few TVs. So people, there would be a few TVs in a village. People would flock to it and, 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 and assemble. And, uh, uh, and the same in the cities. And, you know, the streets were deserted. People were no longer uh, using buses or trains to such an extent that the Indian railways had to cancel most trains running on Sundays while the uh, episodes of the Mahabharata were screened. So, you know, this was actually, in fact, some people have done research precisely on, what is it, uh, Chopra? Huh? Being yeah, Chopra. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, some people have even, you know, there have been a few PhDs done on this, uh, the, the, the impact of the, but it was, it was uh, something that, you know, the whole of India was glued to those few TV screens. And the tradition of Harikatha, which is uh, actually what transmitted those epics through India. And there were people, scholars, uh, who were actually sometimes paid by the state, I'll give you an example later, a, a proof of it later, who were traveling from village to village and then they would you know, be there for uh, seven uh, nights or sometimes more than that and then they would retell, they would have their texts, sometimes they would read out from the texts and this is how the illiterate villagers as Nehru called them became so acquainted, today of course it would be a very different issue, but so acquainted with the text in minute details and even remembering whole passages by heart. So this is an ancient tradition. In fact, if you remember the Ramayana, at the end of it there is a story of Lavan Kusha. And uh, uh, you, you know they come to, uh, um, uh, in fact I think it is uh, Satrugna who uh, comes to the uh, ashrama of Valmiki and then he hears the whole story of Rama being told by these two children. 
you know, and then, well, you know what follows. But this is, in fact, this is, in fact, Harikata. So, so this is an important factor in this cultural integra integration. And uh, it can be studied at many levels. The very eminent Indian sociologist, M. N. Srinivas, who passed away perhaps some 15 years ago. Well, my memory is not very good for, with dates, but he published many texts where he studied the phenomenon which he called Sanskritization. Unfortunately, I don't think this was a very good term because it didn't have much to do with the spread of Sanskrit as such. It had to do with the spread of whatever we've seen earlier. So, well, there could be many other terms proposed, but he said it's a profound and many-sided cultural process. Uh, village goddesses in most parts of India have been identified with Shakti, who is in turn a manifestation of Parvati, the wife of Shiva. The Cobra deity is identified in South India with Subramanya, the warrior son of Shiva. The Kaveri river is identified with Ganga, river Ganges. Rama and Buddha are both regarded as avatars of Vishnu and so on. And he explains how in fact this spread of this culture, by whatever name you want to name it, uh, was something which uh, even, you know, the lowest caste, the lowest strata of the society uh, totally adhered to. And it created a kind of upward movement by which many lower castes were actually trying to ma migrate upward, imitate the customs uh, of uh, uh, higher castes, sometimes even take up, for example, vegetarianism and so on. So this phenomenon has been uh, studied in detail by, by him. It was a, a kind of a consequence of this Sanskritization. Now let us come back to Mahabharata. And I am selecting briefly three regions where separatism in recent decades was particularly strong. And I want to show that uh, this is a very recent phenomenon because uh, we have evidence uh, that uh, they, were, they were absolutely part and parcel of uh, this subcontinent, culturally, of course, geographically. And <clears throat> I start with the South, which had a separatist movement in the 20th century. This is the Dravidian movement, which actually wanted to have its own Dravidistan. And uh, that movement kind of petered out because for the simple reason that he had, it had no popular support. So in the 1960s, it died away. Uh, let us see what Mahabharata says about the, the South. It mentions, and you had, you, uh, I, I showed it on the map, the Cholas, the Pandyas, the Dravidas. And uh, he, the, the, in addition, in the South, we have Chola and Chera kings in inscriptions. We have a lot of inscriptions about this, uh, proudly claiming descent from the lunar and solar dynasties. That is to say, from the, the uh, lines of Rama and, and Krishna. So they say they descend from there because, of course, it is an artificial device, but it's a way to connect themselves. There is an inscription, for example, where a Pandya king boasts that he led the elephant force in the great war on behalf of the Pandavas. And um, that the early Pandyas uh, translated the Mahabharata into Tamil. If that is true, unfortunately, that ancient translation into Tamil is lost. It does not exist. Um, one Chera king uh, claims in an inscription that he was feeding the armies on both sides during the Bharata War. So you have such many such claims which obviously have very little historical basis, if any at all. Uh, so they must not be regarded historically, they must be regarded culturally. This is how you know, those uh, southern dynasties uh, made it clear that they were attached to the uh, uh, main traditions of the land. Uh, let me show you this uh, very interesting hero stone. You know, in, Ta in Tamil Nadu, there are lots of hero stones uh, of this kind, which usually are dedicated to a particular heroic village chieftain. And um, uh, this is in the Nilgiris. We lived a few kilometers away from this place in Banagudishola, where you have a description over five registers of the Pandavas. And these are the five Pandavas here. And uh, very interestingly, this shrine, it is enclosed in a small shrine is maintained by Irula tribals, not by 
regular mainstream Hindus. And uh, those tribals will tell you that uh, this uh, shrine commemorates the passage of the Pandavas through the, the Nilgiris and through this place in particular. Now, if you add up in India all the places where the Pandavas or one of them is supposed to have passed, or Rama, or you know any of these uh, great characters, you will cover the entire map for sure. There is, I believe there is no place in India where somebody did not pass somehow. So this is again something not to be taken uh, 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 you know, at a literal level, but it is a cultural device to connect yourself to this story. Um, well, same, I, 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 I can move a little faster. Kodekanal, there is a, another rock which is called the Rock of the Five Pandavas. Uh, there are many, interestingly, ma very many Draupadi shrines in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. For some reason, Draupadi is almost more popular there than she is in the north. Uh, I, I'm not very sure why. And, of course, many numerous retellings of the epics in the form of popular ballads, uh, some of which have been preserved in manuscript. In, in fact, one recent census by uh, one uh, Dr. Manavalan enumerated 100 versions of the Mahabharata that have come down to us still today in folklore in Tamil Nadu alone. You have 100 retellings of Mahabharata. So if you add up all over India, it's going to run into possibly a few thousands. And the same thing for Ramayana. And you see here, there, is, there are inscriptions recording, as I mentioned earlier, the grants of lands and revenues to poets, uh, for poets and discourse scholars, that is to say the Harikatha scholars on Mahabharata. So they were actually patronized by the state to do, to do that. In the northeast, uh, well, lots of landmarks. I mentioned the Kiratas earlier. They are actually uh, supposed to be one of the main uh, ethnic groups in the northeast. The Prag Jyotisha mentioned in Mahabharata was founded by Naraka, who is technically an Asura, and his son uh, Bhagadatta, who fights Arjuna in the, in the epic. But we also have a king in Northwest, uh, a king of Assam, an ancient king whose name was Bhagadatta. So, you know, there the, the history connects with the mythology, which is very often the case in India. Arjuna, of course, in the story, goes out to Manipura on a mission to placate the Nagas and Maris Ulupi. You may remember the story. Uh, similarly, uh, Bhima's son from Hindimba is quite popular there. And in fact, in the ancient capital of Assam, which was Dim Dimapur, was a corruption of Hindimbapur. So you can see that there are many connections. In fact, even the Bodos, the Bodo tribals who are so much in the news today, have a tradition of they claim that they gave Rukmini, who in their version of the story is a Kirata woman, to Krishna. And they claim Bhagadatta and Hindimba as their ancestors. So what K. Singh writes in this connection, uh, these uh, fine anthropologists, is that if the Bodos have a view of their relationship with pan-Indian traditions, this cannot be described as something imaginary but has to be seen as people's effort to link with historical traditions. This is what I have tried to explain. People continue to identify themselves with the epic traditions, associate places with the visits of the epic heroes, and to recall people's own role in the growing and developing epic traditions. This may be bad history, because it is bad history, if you want really to take history as you know, things which really happened, but it is good myth, and this is what in India we often fail to understand. Uh, and therefore, good anthropology, well, that's his job, of course. Uh, this is why I often say, you know, people say, well, it is a myth, and they, they take it very derog derogatively. Uh, actually, a myth is a cultural device of great importance. It has a life in the cultural life uh, of, of the, the people, and it has a role, it has a function. And uh, which is why we must study mythology of any country if we want to understand you know, the, 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 the culture, the mind of uh, that particular country. So this is well understood in the West, but in India we, we get confused because we tend to insist often that what is actually mythology should be hard historical fact. And it, it won't work, of course. 
you have here, for example, one depiction of the penance of Arjuna, uh, a few centuries BC in a site of Meghalaya. Uh, so this is a terracotta uh, plate, and there would be many more. Kashmir, finally, where uh, the uh, Raja Tarangini of Kalhana uh, traces the origin. This is the famous historical chronicle of Kashmir, which is, uh, this is one of the rare, largely historical texts and chronicles we have in India, where really historical existing kings have been listed and what they did, etc. There could be a little bit of embellishment, but the origin of them is traced to the Mahabharata. Jammu has many traditions uh, uh, related to the epics and one folk version of the Mahabharata. There is a Naga uh, a tribe, I mean, is, is supposed to have lived there. Arjuna came there and he married Ulupi there. So it's very interesting because he marries Ulupi in Kashmir, he marries Ulupi in Assam. So you see, don't, we should not try to insist on geographical or historical accuracy. It will not work. But the cultural device is very clear. Uh, some Kashmiri tribals still today worship the Pandavas and Draupadi as their Ishta Devatas, that is to say their, their dedicated uh, uh, Devata. So this in fact leads me, uh, and I'll spend a couple of minutes on this very important interface with tribal culture, because we saw that um, the, the uh, Mahabharata does not distinguish between mainstream and tribal. This is what K. Singh said. And there could be a lot of evidence shown in this, but the, the British came and created a huge split between the two. And they said basically the, the tribes are the original inhabitants, that is, you know, this uh, word Adivasi, which today has no real anthropological or genetic uh, validity. And then the others are the successive invaders. So, uh, but then you can find many things apart from those I've already shown which contradict this view. For example, I was very struck when I found one anth another anthropologist, Jyotindra Jain, who found in Western India, I think in Maharashtra, a tribe worshipping actually Indra. And Indra is a Vedic god. So normally, normally, you know, in the normal logic of things, you would expect Hindus to be worshipping Indra, but they actually very rarely do so nowadays. And, you know, the, the tribes to be worshipping their own god instead and not a Vedic god. But that's not what the reality is. Uh, many Hindu mainstream kings have been clearly borrowed from tribal pantheons. Jagannath, it is explicitly so. The, the texts... Uh, kept at Puri telling the whole story of Jagannath, do mention that this was um, uh, the, uh, 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 st the initial statue of Jagannath was actually taken by deceit from a tribal community uh, who were, was worshipping him. Uh, Narasimha is another, Ayappa in the south. Ganapati probably has a tribal origin and many aspects of the mother. Then, socially speaking, we have the fact that many uh, tribal warring groups, not all tribes are warring, but in the north especially many were, uh, because there were always territory conflicts. And, uh, you know, when a tribe became powerful enough, in fact, it just migrated into being a Kshatriya clan. So many Kshatriya clans have tribal origins. So, well, this I can skip because this is what I've explained. But in fact, if we want to, you see, in this phenomenon of Hinduism, Hinduism is always extremely difficult to define. You, you can find in, you know, among scholars a hundred different definitions of what is Hinduism. And then uh, the constitution will have one definition and so on and so forth. But in a broad sense, we can take it, this is my empirical definition, as the interface between Vedic, regional, folk and tribal cultures. And um, <coughs> we, we have th this interaction, actually, this interface is very ancient. Uh, we have here evidence of a Paleolithic shrine, archaeological evidence, a Paleolithic shrine in Madhya Pradesh, excavated in the early 1980s <coughs> by <coughs> Jonathan Mark Kenoya with a team from the Allahabad University. There was uh, J.N. Pal, there was G.R. Sharma, and they were very intrigued 
by the fact that they discovered stones like this, which were natural stones, not sculpted. Triangular with this, and different, I'm sorry, I have only a black and white photo, but there are different colors appearing uh, uh, in this stone in a natural way. And uh, they couldn't figure it out, and they were disposed as if on a slightly raised altar. <coughs> so what they did was, as I explained earlier, they went to the nearest tribal communities in this remote region, and they, they investigated, and they were surprised, shocked, in fact, to see that the very same altars with the very same stones were still worshipped today by the tribals. So they asked them, what does this stone mean for you? And the tribal said, it is Shakti, it represents Shakti. So you see that uh, this worship, and this is probably the oldest documented worship in India that we have, 10 to 12,000 years ago, uh, you can see that this, this concept of the mother is very ancient and would have migrated in complex ways which we'll probably never be able to reconstruct. There is a lot more archaeological evidence. This is about 1000 BC from uh, a site <coughs> uh, in Rajasthan called Bhalathal, excavated by Professor Vian Mishra of Deccan College, Gwen Robbins, uh, American archaeologists and others, and you find these uh, skeleton in Padmasana. At least uh, two of them were found and of course in later periods uh, so uh, in, in the same way. So you can see that uh, you know whatever modern ingredients we will take to be part of Hinduism are actually quite ancient. So I'll conclude with these beautiful quotations which uh, again in, in is uh, well let me read it out. It says India has all along been trying experiments in evolving a social unity within which all the different peoples could be held together while fully enjoying the freedom of maintaining their own differences. See that freedom is very important. This process of cultural integration, the spread of the epics or other texts or other cults was never something imposed by anybody. It was actually not even decided upon by anybody. It was just an organic phenomenon which happened. That is all we can say. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 all the regional cultures happily participated in it without necessarily losing their regional stamp or identity. So while fully enjoying the freedom of maintaining their own differences, this has produced something like a United States of a social federation whose common name is Hinduism. Now, well, this would appear again to be a very unsecular an objectionable statement to many of our modern intellectuals uh, who have a very different idea of India as they call it and uh, but then again I'm playing very safe by taking someone whom they could not easily object to and uh, well this is a fact it is a fact that if you take Hinduism in that extended sense of you know the, this uh, uh, interplay with between the original Vedic uh, elements and all the regional, regional elements, folk elements, tribal elements, this is what has happened. If, you, if I take my own village, I live near a village in Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, you can see temples with mainstream Hindu gods like uh, Ganapati, like uh, Shiva, of course, and you will have temples where you will have the Gramam Devatam, you know, the, the village gods. And those are endlessly unique, you know, every village has got different, different gods. They're not part of the mainstream Hindu content. So you can still see today that meeting point of the two. And that meeting point, well, if we take, go by Tagore's definition, that would be uh, Hinduism. So in any case, this is uh, what made uh, India an integrated cultural unit. There is no doubt about it. And uh, all Indologists, all those who have really studied the text, anthropologists also who have studied the, the peoples of India agree on this. And, uh, and this is therefore the making of India. This is how India became one entity. Of course, it was not uh, uh, always uh, one politically. It was in fact very severely divided for most of uh, her history. There's no doubt about it. But nevertheless, that underlying concept of India as uh, one thing uh, did uh, uh, Purdue. And therefore, uh, the, the uh, point of view which I started with uh, this of, of Karl Marx and the one of Seeley who denied in fact uh, this unity 
uh, is something that cannot really uh, be accepted if you look at the evidence objectively. Thank you very much.